Hey everybody, welcome to my first online show. All pieces that are going to be in this show are about 5 by 7 inches or 12 by 17 centimeters. And every one of these cute little pieces are going to be $120. Uh, that's including tax and U.S. shipping and matting. And you can visit online at www.laurageyoung.com under An Inkling of Art. And the reason I'm calling it An Inkling of Art is because every one of these pieces has a little bit of ink in it. All right. So uh, welcome. Hello, everyone. Uh, and welcome to my show. It's called An Inkling of Art. For those of you who are coming across me for the very first time, uh, I'm an artist and illustrator working out of my studio here in beautiful Fort Collins, Colorado. And uh, this is Skeeter. He's my uh, nearly 20-year-old uh, African red belly parrot, and he is my muse and constant companion. And hopefully he won't squawk too much during the show. So this is my very first online show. And so hopefully uh, I'll be able to pull it off without a hitch. What I'm planning on doing is I'm going to show you uh, all 21 pieces during the course of an hour, if not sooner. And we're going to go over um, you know, what they're called, what the process was behind them, and a little story that I wrote for each one. So, oh, hi, everybody joining. Got some more people joining on. Good to see you. Um, as I said before, my name is Laura Young. Uh, I am uh, an artist here in Fort Collins, Colorado, and I'm hosting my very first online show. I'm a little bit nervous if you can hear it in my voice, uh, but I'm really excited to share my work with you here today. Um, you can go to uh, my website here at, uh, oops, it's upside down, <laughs> at www.laragyoung.com. Um, it's also in my bio. Uh, on Instagram here, so you can click on that link and it'll take you uh, to an inkling in art, which is the show. So let's get to it here. Um, got these pieces here. I think I'm going to start uh, just in order, which is funny because it's actually kind of backwards from the order that I, I made the works in. But uh, hi, good to see some new people. Um, so this first piece I've got here, um, if you, can you see that? Wave if you can. Say, hey, I see it. I think you can. Uh, this is uh, Indian ink, India ink and uh, watercolor that I put together. It's an aspen grove here in Rocky Mountain National Park. And uh, it was after a month of me doing a lot of ink work. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to start adding some color to this. And so I uh, used some ultramarine blue and some other watercolor tones and went over the ink that I put in. And you can see it actually, you can zoom in really close to it on the website. Uh, but it's five by seven inches, so it's, it looks real big on your screen here, but it's actually pretty petite. And what I do with these is uh, when I send them to you, I put um, an acid-free matting behind it like this, and that way, and a board, and it'll be affixed with uh, archival uh, museum tape. So that way you can put just, when you get it, it gets sent in uh, a mailer like this, and it's pretty sturdy and it gets sent and then you take it out and you can pop it in any frame you wish. But this is nice because it protects it and uh, it just makes it look really nice if it's a gift or whatever. So this particular piece I call uh, All the Complicated Details. And it's piece number two in the series. So if you go to the website, it'll be, I'll ca I call it inkling number two. So you'll be able to find it right away. And, uh, and so I wrote, um, and some of these I wrote an original story, and some of them I just uh, posted a favorite snippet of a poem. And I think this one's a poem by William Carlos Williams. He was a 20th century poet. In fact, he wrote this poem 100 years ago. So I'll read you the poem while you can look at this. And it's called All the Complicated Details. All the complicated details of the attiring and the disattiring are completed. A liquid moon moves gently amongst the long branches. Thus, having prepared their buds against a sure winter, the wise trees stand sleeping in the cold." So that's why I called it All the Complicated Details, because of the poem. All right, so that was painting number two. And I had to write this backwards, by the way. All these signs that I wrote, I had to write them backwards because they, in Instagram Live, I don't know if you guys have done this before, 
but it actually does it backwards. So I haven't been able to figure out how to unbackwards it. So hopefully you can read this. I even had to do the numbers all over because I, I thought they were right, but they were backwards. Okay, so number three, that was number two. If you're wondering, number two, uh, one has already sold. It was just that popular, like that. So that's heading out to um, a collector here in Fort Collins. So I'm sorry if someone was really interested in the number one. But number two is still available, and number three is still available. And this is another India ink piece with watercolor. Uh, India ink is awesome. I, you know, usually I'm a, a pure watercolorist, but I've learned that when you're using ink, you can get these really intense blacks and they're very permanent. And uh, so I put that first down first and then I watercolor over it and you just get this really kind of neat look to it. You can get a lot more detail than you can with the watercolor by itself. And uh, if you go online once again to uh, my website, at uh, www.largeyoung under an inkling of art you can see these really up close and uh, get a better feel from even than from this live uh, feed that i'm giving you guys so this one here let's go to the website here let me back up um this one is also has a, an accompanying poem this time by uh bernard barton uh, from his work uh, from 1822, Stanzas on the Approach of Winter. So I'm going to read that to you while I show you this piece. This is once again piece number three called Tis Autumn. Tis autumn and the shortening day, the chilling evening's sober gray, and winds that hoarser blow, the fading foliage of the trees, which rustles sear in every breeze the approach of winter snow. So that is inkling number three. And that one, uh, like all these pieces I mentioned before at the beginning, but if you're new, um, these are all five by seven inches and they're about $120 US, uh, but they come fully matted and uh, ready to go in a frame and uh, tax and shipping and all that's included in that price. So normally my work goes for a little bit more than this, but because it's directly out of my studio, I'm able to make it a little bit uh, less this time around. So there you go. That was number three, Tis Autumn. Oh, and these, oh, I forgot to mention, these are aspen trees, which we have lots of here in Colorado, and they're one of my favorite subjects to, to draw and paint. Okay, let's see, how are we for time? Okay, we're doing great. So now we have number four in the art show. Let's just pretend you're walking along in a gallery and you just kind of came across this one. Okay, this one is called Something Waits Beneath It, and it's number four. Once again, this is a, a trail up through Rocky Mountain National Park on the way to Emerald Lake, and uh, it's ink with watercolor put over it. And let's see here, it goes, let's see, this was actually, I put a quote from one of my favorite uh, watercolorists, Andrew Wyeth, to go with this, if you guys are familiar with him. Uh, wonderful 20th century uh, watercolorist, uh, really neat stuff. Uh, and he wrote, and I quoted him for the title of this, which is Something Waits Beneath It, quote, I prefer winter and fall when you feel the bone structure of the landscape, the loneliness of it, the dead feeling of winter. Something waits beneath it. The whole story doesn't show. And once again, you can see this piece. It's number four. Uh, I call it inkling number four, but the actual title is Something Waits Beneath It, and it's on my website. Okay. We're getting to the last of the watercolors, and the rest is pure ink. Uh, this one here, you guys know these. These are the very, very widespread geese, Canada geese. They get around. They're, they're tourists to all kinds of places. Uh, Fort Collins is actually very well known for these guys. They come in down in masses every year. Uh, although, you know, I think they're late migrating this year. I haven't seen as many of them, or it could just be the urban corridors just getting so full that they, they kind of skip us. But uh, this piece here, once again, it's ink, and then I took some burnt umber and burnt siennas, and I washed over it, and it, it's kind of hard to see. You'd have to go to the website to get a really good close-in look at it, but you can get an idea here, and once again, of the size. It's very petite, and it mails real easy. Um, this one, let's see, let's click on the website. This one is a real short poet snippet that I named this one for. It's called Through the Fields 
I'm sorry, Though the Fields Lay Golden by poet Rachel Field, and she wrote this in 1934, and I'll read the little snippet to you. Through the fields lay golden. Something told the wild geese it was time to go. Though the fields lay golden, something whispered, snow. So that's uh, by Rachel Field. And, uh, but the artwork is by me, Lara G. Young. So there's that piece. That is number, inkling number five on the website. And so he's still available too. And then we have, okay, ready for the pure ink? Oh, we got some more people. Hi guys, where are we go? Wow, I have so many names I don't recognize. Cool. Um, let me know where you guys are from when you get a chance. I'd love to see where you're coming in from. Um, as I've mentioned before, I'm here in Fort Collins, Colorado. I've been here since 1983. So I'm a mostly local. Um, originally, I was born in uh, Hun um, Huntington, West Virginia, in a little town uh, nearby there. Uh, but I've been out here so long, I've lost most of my accent. So, but uh, people still don't consider you a local if you weren't born here. So I'm a mostly local. All right, to the ink. All right, let me get to the website. And the next piece. Ah, this one is one that I wrote. Um, right here. I don't know if you can see this. This is a landscape, 100% India ink on Bristol board, which is this kind of paper. It's uh, very, very durable and uh, holds up really well to ink because ink, um, what I do, these, these are not done with just regular ink markers. These are done with actual uh, ink nibs. In fact, let me show you real quick before I start reading about this. Um, this is a thing I've really started coming into this year to add to my watercolors, but I use these pens. These are um, a dip nib pen. You take the nibs and you um, put them into like this. Can you see that? This was a technology very much used in the Victorian era. And once ballpoint pens and fountain pens and all those were invented, it's been largely uh, disused. I think comic artists, some of them still use these, but overall, uh, they are no longer in the mainstream. So I use that. And what you do is when you dip them in the ink, you know, the old ink bottles, I put them in and then, I don't know if you can see this, but the, it actually will splay outwards. Do you see that? And you can get a variance of line that's really hard to get even with modern pens. So you can make really thin and then really thick and then thin again. And uh, it's really cool. Oh, hi, someone's in Og Ogden, Utah. Hi, Utah, good to see you. I love Utah. Uh, let's see here. So that was about that. And if you have any questions, by the way, feel free at any time to ask me um, about the work or about the technique or any anything. Um, so here is this piece. And I call it, There's No Patch Like Home. And I'm going to read to you the little bit I put behind it. Okay, can you see it? All right. There's no patch like home. Like any hobby, bird watching can get out of hand. Gobs of money can be spent on scopes, cameras, and above all, travel. I know of birders who've dropped the cash equivalent of a new car to visit a cold, wind-bitten Alaskan island in order to snag a bird on their life list. Myself, I'm more of what they call a patch birder. All patch birding requires is access to a local park or neighborhood. That's it. You don't even need a pair of binoculars if you can identify by ear. You try to visit as often as you're able, say once a week. Uh, this area becomes your patch, your little microcosm of the world. You get to know the birds and they get to know you. Over the years, I've sighted oodles of species in my patch, a reservoir and an otherwise dry stretch of prairie. Countless ducks and gulls are regulars. Egrets and herons gracefully perch the cottonwood trees. Occasionally, a northern harrier or bald eagle will swing past gliding without effort as they search for prey. In the spring, warblers flit in and out of the underbrush, and in the fall, gaggles of geese congregate on the water. Of course, it's nice to travel to exotic locales from time to time, but when in a pinch, there's no patch like home. So this is my, my local birding patch, as you can see. Fossil Creek Reservoir. And there's the, the geese. Oh, someone asked me a question. Renzo, hey, long time no see. Uh, question, what is your biggest inspiration in nature and also in art? Oh, that is such a deep question. 
what is my biggest inspiration? Uh, I can't even explain it. Can you? Uh, for me, it's uh, I, there's just something when I see a bird or a tree. I, I just when I when I'm drawing it or painting it, I feel like it's really enabling me to see it for the first time. Like to really like I'm describing it bit by bit by bit and that way I really feel like I get to know the subject if that makes sense I mean well you're an artist too so you know <laughs> hopefully that's that's helpful um I'll try to elaborate more later but thanks for asking and thanks for for watching the show all right let's see we're on number seven number seven is inkling number seven I call it formerly not an uncommon bird and do any of you recognize this duck? Anybody? My guess is no, and I'll tell you why. Because not only was it rare in its day, but it's been extinct for over a hundred years. This is the Labrador duck. That's the male, and that's the female. And once again, this was all done with an India ink with this scritchy little nib. And in this piece, I was trying to, to give it a look of, uh, of an old, Old world engraving um, and once again if you go on the website you can see all the little scritchy details it took a bit of time and it was based off of an actual engraving uh, it was an anonymous uh, artist I looked and looked I could not find out who did the original it was in uh, a dictionary um, for the entry for Labrador duck right before they became extinct so and you can see the ink do you see how it kind of shimmers do you see that yeah, that's the lacquer that's in the ink and that that keeps it and when I do watercolor over these which I sometimes do it'll uh, keep it from uh, blurring out it'll stay nice and sharp so let's see so what I wrote with this I actually took um, a snippet from a book uh, from 1898 and this is what they had to say about the Labrador duck formerly not an uncommon bird among the along the Atlantic coast as far south as Delaware the Labrador duck has, for over 20 years, ceased to make its appearance anywhere within our boundaries, and it would seem that, from some reason quite unexplicable, it has become extinct. And that was from uh, The Wildfowl of the United States and British Possessions by Francis P. Harper in 1898. So we barely knew this bird existed, and then it ceased to be altogether. And it's one of the great mysteries, and nobody really knows why what happened to them there's a lot of different speculation but uh, science has yet to to answer that for us but they're gorgeous they're black and white birds there's only a handful of specimens left and they're all kind of sad and stuffed um, but yeah that was formerly not an uncommon bird number seven and you can take him home or give him to somebody all right I'll take a bit of tea here Whoop. Oh, I got some more people. Hi, guys. Wow, this is so neat having all these new faces. So if you're just joining me and you're not aware what's going on, I'm doing uh, an art show, my first one ever here out of my studio, uh, because my usual uh, winter exhibitions and shows uh, just kind of went belly up. So I thought, you know what, I could just sit here and feel sorry for myself. Or I could just talk to you directly and show you, you know, some little pieces that I've put together. So because for me, the biggest part of doing shows is the interaction. I, I really love getting to meet people face to face and share my art with them and hear their stories because they usually connect because they know a bird or a place and it's just really neat. Uh, so let's see, the next piece I was going to show you, see I'm doing this from my website by the way, I've got my website up so you can visit it too. Um, it's a, a link in the bio or you can go to, oops, upside down. Uh, www.laragyoung.com under an inkling of art. I've got a little button there. You click on that and it'll take you to this and it'll show you all the different artworks and you can zoom in on them up close and it'll uh, give you a little bit more information. And it also has, uh, I just put up last night, all the things that I'm reading are also on there. So if you can't catch this whole thing, you can uh, go and read it for yourself on the website. So the next piece that I'm clicking on is inkling number eight. <laughs> what am I doing? I need to show you the actual piece. <laughs> there he is. <laughs> so this little guy is, um, he, <laughs> he 
is a little baby bird. Um, uh, uh, they used to call them Hollywood finches or rose finches, but they're really just the common house finch, and we have a ton of them here. Oh, hi, Arta. Good to see you, by the way. Uh, and uh, so these little guys uh, will make nests up around uh, in our yard. Uh, they're not afraid of humans hardly at all, but their babies go through this kind of awkward stage when they're fledging where their little feathers or their little fluff, the, um, I think there's a technical name for it, uh, the, the little plumes, like natal plumage, I think is what they call it, uh, baby, baby fluff. Uh, still sticks on the top of their heads, even though they can fly and are pretty autonomous, and they just look hilarious. So I thought I would uh, do a little drawing of him once again with the with the ink. And uh, so, and for this one, I didn't write a big story. I just had a short quote that day. Um, I found one by someone called uh, Morihei Ushiba, and it goes, "Your heart is full of fertile seeds, waiting to sprout." Just like the little sprouted feathers are so cute. So this one, um, once again, he's number eight, Inkling Eight, waiting to sprout, and he's still available on the website. And and you're being pretty good, Skeeter. See if this bird. I always joke if he if he acts up too much during the show, he's gonna get sold during the show. Yeah, would you like that? I put you in a package, send you off. No, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> but yeah, he's he's like, what's going on? This is Skeeter, by the way. If you guys don't know this, he's my uh, nearly 20-year-old African red belly. And uh, they're not super common in the pet trade because they're kind of obnoxious and they squawk a lot and they bite. But uh, he, we are his third home, hopefully his forever home. And uh, we've had him for 10 years uh, of his 20. And uh, he gets a little bit more mellow every year. So, so if you're squawking, that's what's going on. Um, oh, hi, Ian. Good to see you. Gosh, it's so cool to see so many friends and faces. Ah, I could do this every day. <laughs> okay, so that was number eight. We're on to inkling number nine. Inkling number nine is a toucan. There he is. <laughs> and once again, done 100% in India ink. Now, this is interesting. This part here was done as a wash with some water into the, the ink itself. So it gives it this kind of neat look. It looks like, like watercolor, but it's actually ink. So it's super permanent. And you can see the shimmer. See that? Yeah. So I'm going to read the little bit I wrote for this one. And I call this one Taco the Toco Toucan. <laughs> Thrown for a loop. Or can a corporation copyright a toucan? In 2011, the Maya Archaeology Initiative, a nonprofit organization, received legal notification that their Toucan logo was infringing on the copyright of Kellogg's Fruit Loops cereal mascot, Toucan Sam. The only problem was MAI's Toucan looked nothing like Toucan Sam, not by a long shot. One was a stylized depiction of a particular toucan species with a Mayan temple background, and the other was, well, a cartoon character whose bill mimicked food coloring. Turns out, Kellogg's had a long story of going after any company that had a toucan on it, from pruning shears to tiki bars. Even a steel drum band called the Toucans received stern notification that their name was snagging profits from the world's largest cereal manufacturer. And most of the time, the smaller companies had to back down, regardless of the dissimilarity of or unproven product competition. But, by 2011, the age of ubiquitous social media was well underway. Word soon got out about MAI's plight and the massive legal costs that the nonprofit would have to bear due to the blanket practice of opposing each and every toucan. Consequently, Kellogg's dropped the copyright opposition claim and, in order to repair what was becoming a bad look for public relations, donated $100,000 to one of MAI's archaeological projects. It was a good outcome for all, but it highlights just how zealous and downright loopy legal departments can be. <laughs> so that's that's the story behind this taco the ta ta taco taco the toco toucan. Why did I name it that? <laughs> Inkling number nine still available. Oh look at that! Hi, hi Chris, nice to see you. Oh, that's okay. You guys can, you know, I'm gonna put this online so you can watch it again when it's all done in case you were late and missed the beginning and all. So thank you for showing up. So good to see you. All right, and then we've got, let's see, now we're up to, oh, we're halfway through, guys. 
this is going to, this one, this is one of my favorite ones. I, you know, I really didn't want to let it go, <laughs> but if I keep every single one of my artworks, I, I'm not going to have any room for me, the husband or the parrot, because we'll just be under stacks of paintings and drawings. So <sighs> I'm going to put it up. Here he is. This is, of course, the Canada goose. And you, you can see, once again, see that shine from the, the ink? Look at that. That is a lot of ink that went into that. In fact, um, if you, you know, I used this for all of these little detail bits, but then when I got to the pure black, I actually had to get out the brush and just very carefully put that on there because that would have taken like years to do it with the pen by itself. So and this one here, I call it Sparkbird Canada Goose. So I'm going to read you another birding story. Bear with me. It's short. So what was your spark bird? If you hang around bird watchers enough, it's a question that comes up. Just like any passion, birding has its fair share of insider jargon. Words like dip, pish, and fallout are overheard at many events, as is the term spark bird which refers to the bird that first kindled a lifelong interest in this fanatical obsession, I mean, hobby. <laughs> I've loved birds for as long as I can remember, but perhaps the species that sparked an interest in understanding them more deeply was the Canada goose. As a girl, I'd go to the park to feed a population of domestic ducks, but there'd always be a group of itinerant Canada geese as well. They'd always look so dapper with their long black necks and white cheeks. As I got to know them better, I began to notice that some of them had individual characteristics that set them apart from the others. Why was it, I wondered, that some of them had shorter, stubbier bills? Why did some of them have a white stripe at the base of their neck? Why did some of them honk in a much higher pitch like they'd inhaled helium? Since this was before the internet, I had to go to the library to find out. These smaller geese, I learned, were a subspecies of Canada goose, known as cackling geese. That someone else had noticed these slight differences was exciting to me, and so began a lifelong interest in bird identification and behavior. Nowadays, the Canada goose and cackling goose are considered two genetically distinct species. Nevertheless, I consider them both to be my spark. So that is my Canada goose. Oh, for, oh, it was for you. It was a robin. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Robins are up there as well, to be honest, but I knew what a robin was. Like, I just, I wasn't sure. I knew, you know, I knew what ducks were. I didn't know what these guys were initially when we first moved out here from West Virginia. And uh, so that I think is what got me really into figuring out the exactness of what these birds were. But yeah, robins are awesome. Was it an English robin or an American robin? Because th those are two different things and they're both adorable. In fact, I had a robin uh, build a nest right on my front porch last year. It was so cool. American robin, by the way, if you hadn't figured that one out. Uh, okay. Woo, get some tea. Oh, you guys, I can't believe you're all hanging in here for my first live show. I was so nervous. Uh, but you guys have put me at ease about that. Thank you so much for, for showing up. Uh, okay, so we're going to do number... Oh, European. Oh, they're so cute. I love those little Europeans. Um robins they're they're just adorable I, I i see why they use them all the time on christmas cards and all kinds of, of neat things over there uh, okay number 11 okay this one has a story <laughs> actually no this one has a poem because uh some of you guys know but not all of you that um, my other love besides art is uh writing and uh, and I write a lot of really horrible poetry. Um, and I'm attempting my first novel as well, uh, after many, many false starts over the years. Uh, but for the poetry, I'm going to inflict a little bit of that, that on you here in just a second. Um, in fact, I'll just do a snippet of it. It's from a poem called Crispy. So here we go. Ready? Crispy. I'm craving something crispy. I need a salty crunch. Carbs so keenly tasty for brunch or even lunch. So there we have it. 
that was a section of my poem crispy and i was inspired by um there have been several instances now where seagulls go um up to uh establishments you know little kiosks or shops by the sea and uh they just snag a bag of whatever they can and take off with it like little thieves and uh but you can't blame them i mean it's real quick and easy cheap calories right uh, but uh, yeah, we have seagulls here in Colorado, if you didn't know that, uh, but we don't call them seagulls. They're technically gulls for the birding crowd out there. If you call them seagulls, they'll just be like, uh, but, uh, but yeah, this one is actually uh, a gull that was uh, here in Fort Collins. And, uh, but I, uh, you know, mentally photoshopped in <laughs> this bag of chips and it's a popular uh, brand in Scotland. So I just thought it'd be fun to put those two together. And he's available for the chip or seagull lover in your life uh, at the website. Once again, uh, let's see here. Uh oh, now I'm starting to pile stuff up. So I've been showing all this stuff. Where'd it go? Ah! Okay, well, you're going to have to, it's in the link, www.laragyoung.com. I can't believe I've already misplaced my little placard. You got too much stuff here. Uh, okay. Next, next piece is in the show because we have 21 pieces. We're over halfway through. So thanks so much for watching. Ah, this is going to have a good story. Here we have, yeah, and that's my, my parrot Skeeter who's getting a little fussy because he's now realizing he's not the center of attention here. Yeah, Skeeter, we just got a little bit more. Okay, can you hang in there? Yeah, okay. Uh, put you over there. Okay, so here we have another ink drawing once again done with my dip pen and look at how much ink is on this little chick is so black look how shiny he is from all that ink it's amazing but this if you guys don't know what it is is a takahe and what is a takahe you might ask well there's not that many of them in the world nowadays uh when i was visiting new zealand uh, there was just about 200 left in the entire world. Um, they're a big flightless uh, blue and green bird, uh, but their babies are pure jet black and fluffy. And they look like Muppets. They, they're just adorable. Uh, but now uh, they've almost doubled that number since I visited a few years back. So hopefully, hopefully they're on the rebound. But I wrote about my encounter with this bird, this little baby bird in the wild, uh, well, technically at a, a reserve, an island that was set aside. So I'm going to read to you about this guy. So you can look at him and he's, you can see him even more up close on the website and the bio. And my, there's a link in my bio that'll take you directly to my website and you can see him really close. So here's the story. Ready? Okay. Look, do you see it? There in the tall New Zealand grass, strode a young takahe, one of the rarest birds in the world. Only 260 were left. Nearby, a shaggy parent, about the size of a chicken, herded its fuzzy black progeny into the shade. My heart skittered with excitement. It was like coming across a dodo, living, breathing, wobbling around. Because, just like the dodo, the takahe was utterly flightless and, in 1898, officially declared extinct. Fast forward to the mid 20th century and the species was much to the astonishment of everyone rediscovered in a remote mountainous area. Their numbers were few and dwindling though. And by the 1950s, it looked as though the archaic looking birds would go extinct for real. So the remainder were scooped up and brought to several outlying islands safe from non-native predators. In 2013, my husband and I were exploring one such sanctuary, Tiri Tiri Matangi, situated offshore from Auckland. It was a veritable paradise with lush, thick stands of pahutukua, I can, I can never say that tree, and uh, puriri trees, sheltering all sorts of threatened birds. We only caught a glimpse of the takahe, but I'll always cherish the memory of that encounter. We, uh, with continuing encroachment on their habitat, the future of this species remains hopeful yet somewhat unclear, fuzzy as it were, as that little black chick. There he is. Oh, we got some more people. Hi, good to see you. Thank you so much for showing up to my live show out of my studio. I really appreciate you guys showing up. 
So I'm just going through my, my works, the 21 pieces that I have on sale on the website, and I'm just giving a little blurb or explanation behind each one. But if you have any questions at any time, feel free to put it up there and I'll try to answer it during the live feed. And uh, I'm also putting this whole thing online uh, so you can watch it again if uh, you know, or if you want to share it with someone. And then you say, hey, there's this Colorado artist. You got to see her stuff. And uh, this show is going to be going on all the way through till Tuesday, the end of the month here. And then after that, I take them back down. So just to let you know, it's a special one-time deal. Okay, let's see. We're going back to, oh, we're on page two on the website. Because as I was explaining, it's on the website. And you can see all the pieces. And what's really cool is when you click on them, let's see if I'll show you. You can go like this and it'll actually, maybe not on here. But yeah, you see that? It'll zoom in and you can look at the pieces up close and see all the little brush strokes. Okay, I'm gonna get a bit of tea. <laughs> Have any of you guys done a live thing like this? It's really something. It's, uh, it's not, it's uh, different. Usually I get all dressed up and uh, you know, we have, you know, snacks and drinks and, you know, everyone's acting all hoity-toity in the art gallery. And this is just a little bit, you know, more homey. I kind of like it. All right. So this is number 13. Oh, we got another story. Okay. So this is a seabird. We don't see them too often here in Colorado. It's a red knot and I've got a story behind it and it's called Believe It or Not. <laughs> so here goes the story. Ready? Okay, see if they'll focus on him. Here's the story. There's a plump sort of sandpiper called a knot, whose name hints at a legendary origin. Newt the Great was an 11th century English warrior king who was much feared and respected. Some even said he wielded supernatural abilities. When word reached his ears that his people were in such awe of him, he ordered that his courtiers place his throne on the seashore just as the tide was coming in. Then Newt called out in his most commanding voice, See, you are subject to me, as is the land on which I am sitting is mine, and no one has resisted my overlordship with impunity. I command you, therefore, not to rise onto my land, nor to presume to wet the clothing or limbs of your master. Nevertheless, the sea continued to rise, and the waves soaked the king up to his waist. The people were aghast. Newt then calmly waded ashore, dried himself off, and said, Let all the world know that the, the power of kings is empty and worthless. There is no king worthy of the name save him by whose will heaven, earth, and the sea obey eternal laws. And with that, he took off his crown and placed it on the ground, never to wear it again. Some say that the local sandpipers who witnessed this scene were so impressed by such humility that they would forever murmur, Newt, Newt, amongst themselves as they dashed back and forth in the tide. Others say that the birds were simply a favorite dish of the king, best served piping hot with bread and milk. Either way, the species now bears his name, which over time corrupted from Newt into Knot. So that's the story behind the name of the Knot bird. You like that one? That was a little long. <laughs> uh, but as I said before, I'm uh, not only an artist, I'm an aspiring novelist. And uh, so I'm uh, taking it out on you guys, kind of cross-pollinating as it were. Okay, this piece I did uh, as an experiment. This one was actually done quite rapidly, as you can see, by the sketchiness of it. Because the others were very painful and my, my hand was starting to cramp up from doing all of these in a row. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to do a, 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 a looser piece and uh, see what happens. And it's got the, the ink as a wash. Do you see how it just kind of bled and did its own thing? It's really kind of neat to, to do that. Uh, unlike watercolor, though, I mean, watercolor is fairly permanent and hard to lift, but ink, when it's down, it is down, and you're not going to be able to, to lift it. So I had to get it right, even though it was loose and sketchy. 
So this one, let's see here, I call the falcon steeping from above. And this is a snippet from uh, Alexander Pope, um, who wrote in 1734 in his essay on man. This is a little snippet that I put to go with this piece. Say, will the falcon stooping from above smit with her varying plumage spare the dove? Admires the jay, the insect's gilded wings, or hears the hawk when Philomena sings. So that is this piece. And I, it's kind of hard to tell, but this one, when, as I've mentioned before, these are going to come with uh, a matting. Yeah, just a second. Uh, of course, I've misplaced it already. Here we go. So just to show you, if you're wondering why it looks like that bird has its head cut off, it's because it was going to be framed. When you put it in a frame, it gives you that sense of mystery. There we go. Like that. See, so it's all about the hawk chasing the pigeon here. So, oh, thanks for showing up. And yeah, feel free to watch later. Um, um, Marcia, oh, so nice to see you. But everyone else, you're hanging in there. Thank you so much. We're almost done going through these. So that was inkling number 14, the falcon stooping from above. All right, now we have 15. And this one has a fun story. Let's see here, oh, hang on. Hmm. As some of you know, I've spent some time in Africa in various countries and I love folk tales and stories. And so I've, I came across several different varying stories regarding the tick bird, which is this guy here. And, uh, and I've put it together in a story. So it's called Tick Bird and Zebra, number 15. Once upon a time, before the sun was old and yellow with age, Tick Bird made her hut in a thick bed of grass. It was so well hidden that no one could see it. But one day, Zebra wandered over and accidentally ate the hut, grass roof and all. You fool, Tick Bird screeched. That was my home. I didn't mean to, said Zebra. I was hungry. Well, well, so am I, but you don't see me eating your house. I'm sorry. Here, look, I have lots of ticks and flies crawling around on me. You are more than welcome to them. The nerve, said Tick Bird, but she hopped over to Zebra anyway. She stuffed her beak with insects as she continued to fuss. Honestly, you would think that you were doing me a favor. I ask you. And she is still arguing and eating off Zebra's back until this very day. The end. So that is the story of Tick, Bird, and Zebra. And once again, this is all India ink, and you can see the shimmer from the ink. That was a real fun piece to put together. And now we are up to 16. And I, once again, I'm reading it backwards because I put, I, just to let you know, every single one of the Im these images is flipped. When you go to the website, you'll see how the actual um, direction is. And this is another New Zealand story. Let's see here. Yeah. So this is the story of the fantail or piwaka waka is what they call it in the Maori language, which I think is really lovely. And this is a personal story, by the way. So here we go. I call it Fantail and Carry On. I have to stop, I said. I can't go on. Tears of frustration blurred the trail. We'd been trekking three days in, New Zeal in the New Zealand bush, and I was experiencing increasing pain as we zigzagged our way down a ridge. Something was wrong with my knees. The first day, they'd been fine. So had the second. But somewhere around mile 23, it was as if my cartilage had worn away and every step caused a wince. I had, of course, packed too much, way too much, and our initial pace down the steep, unrelenting incline only added to the strain. So, like an overloaded camel, I groaned, collapsed, and refused to move. My hiking partner and I had to be at a certain pickup point by 4 p.m., and there was no way we were going to be able to make it. We'd be stuck in the bush for the night with swarms of biting flies with nowhere to stay. <sighs> if I'd only packed lighter, if only I'd paced myself better. Tears flowed more freely as no one could see us, 
The rest of the group, even the slowest stragglers, had already hiked past. Chick, chick. A small drab bird landed on my trekking pole. Chick. It spread out its wings and began a curious display, flicking and fanning its long tail as it pirouetted on the pole. It was a piwaka waka, also known as a fan tail. Mesmerized, I stopped crying. It flew to my shoulder, chick, and then my head, chick, made one last chirp, and then it took off as suddenly as it had arrived. After a rest, I managed to limp down to more level ground and finish the last 10 miles of the trek. Nowadays, whenever I consider giving up on something that seems too formidable, I think on that bright little bird and carry on. So that's the story of the Piwaka Waka. Okay, guys, we are nearly through. We got 17 here. This one is one of, also one of my favorites, and I kind of hate to put it up. But someone will enjoy him. As you can see, these are, can you see them? Let's see. Zoom. There he is. That is a gannet, a gannet colony. Oh, hey, Renzo, you're still here. Awesome. Good to see you. Um, these are the gannets, once again, on my New Zealand trip. And uh, they were on these really big rocks. And I'll get to their story real quick. Oh, these are some longer stories. Hopefully I'll have time. And if not, I will uh, resume doing them in another bit because they only give me one hour. Uh, and after that, it gets, I don't know if it, how much it'll record. So um, I tried to pl plan this for a lot of people's lunch break so they can catch it and go on. So... Oh, hi. Good to see you, Ron. Okay, so here we go. This is number 17. I call it Gannets Galore. And it's another 5 by 7 India ink on Bristol board. So here's the little blip. So many gannets. So many. They filled the sky with their chatter, swooping gracefully. They covered every nook and cranny on the top of the cliff we'd climbed, with permission, oblivious to the human activity below. And actually, when we were on it, it was a real tall. This was just the sea stacks. And everywhere, everywhere, there was guano, white and chalky, making distant sea stacks glisten like snow-peaked mountains. New Zealand's uh, Te Kauea a Maui, or Cape Kidnappers Peninsula, has one of the largest accessible gannet colonies in the world, and consequently, lots of uh, bird um, effusion, shall we say. One had to keep an eye out, as it was easy to end up under an aerial approach and splat. Still, an amazing place. So there we have it. And the white in this, in case you were wondering, I actually scraped out a lot of this with a Zacto knife. So this is all ink on this particular piece. And so ink wash behind. But when I look at those pieces, I can still hear the gulls and the, the, the really interesting uh, call of the gannets. It's hard to describe them. You have to look them up. It's, it's really otherworldly to have thousands of them making the same sounds all at once. Okay. And here we have a helmeted guinea fowl. And this is number 18 in the show. We're almost uh, to the end. Let's see here. I had so much fun with this piece. This particular one, I actually had to use white ink because as you can see, it would have taken a lot more patience than even I have. And I have a lot of patience to go around each and every one of those pieces there. So those spots. In fact, let's see here, how are we for time? Okay, I'm gonna move that one. Tell you what, I am going to skip the story for this one. It is on the website, but it is another fun folk tale as to how the guinea got her spots. And uh, once again, it's at www.laragium and under uh, an inkling of art. And here, this is another really cool piece. I think I might see here. Come here. This one is called uh, Gyoa's Passage. And look at that. This piece I had a lot of fun doing. This one is primarily India ink with a little bit of white ink just for the seabirds up here and a little bit in the water. I don't know if you can see that. 
And uh, this one's another long tale uh, because I'm running low on time. I'm going to direct you to the website so you can read about it. But it's about uh, the quest for the Northwest Passage and um, about uh, uh, Edmundson's, the, the captain, his, his crazy adventure to get to it up in the north. And this one, once again, is available on the website. And this is my favorite one, and I'll be sad if it goes, but I'll be happy too because someone else will be able to enjoy them as well. All right, we've got two more, and I will read the stories for these real quick. So and this one, so look how shiny this one is. This one has so much ink on it. Look at that. Blah. But when you have it matted in frame, you don't, you don't notice the shine. Okay, let's see here. Here we have, I call this one Owl Interlude. Did you hear that? Hear what? An owl, says the wife, on the roof. It's 3 a.m. in the morning and the bedroom is black as a pool of ink. Silence. Then a hoot startles them both. The husband rolls over onto his side. Okay, yeah, owl. Rich and sonorous, the hoots continue. An indeterminate amount of minutes or hours pass by in that strange liminal space between a sleep and a wake. There, it's another one. It must be another one answering back. There's a different pitch, a higher one. Wow, it has a lot to say. Must be the female of the pair. <laughs> the wife snorts in the dark. By the time she works out a clever comeback, her maid is enviously insensible. Hoot, one one thousand. Hoot, two one thousand. In her mind's eye, the two owls are swooping over an endless sheep fence in feathered silence until she too drifts into dreams. Last but not least, guys, we have, this is my other favorite, this is George. George is a real raven, and I wrote a little story about him as well. Here he is. Click on the website, and you can see him up close. And on the website, it looks like he's just a little square, but he's actually um, to be framed up. Let's see here. What do I do with him? Uh-oh. Mm, of course, I misplaced it. How does this happen? Like, it was right here in front of me. Well, you're just going to have to take my word for it. But basically, it, the framing is going to go all the way around to here. So it looks like he's sticking out a little bit. It's not just squared. You get the full 5 by 7 So it gives you a little bit of space to breathe with the composition. But for whatever reason, the, the website picture made it a square. So this is George. When my better half and I were up near Yellowstone National Park, we stopped at a gas station tucked in a pine grove. Out of nowhere, a very large raven flapped over to us. He began to strut around, accusingly eyeing the bag of Fritos we'd just purchased. Sorry, this isn't good for you, I said. The raven then began to follow me to the Subaru, hopping about and making piteous gronking sounds. Just then, another car rolled up. Seeing that I wasn't an easy mark, he scuttled over to the newcomers. Delighted, they tossed him a handful of Oreos. Concerned about the bird's human habituation and of long-term health, I asked the gas station attendant if he knew about this. Oh, that's just George, he said. As it turns out, George was a regular fixture and had been fleecing gullible tourists for more than 20 years, maybe longer, said the attendant. That bird was here even before my old boss took over the place. Now, ravens have been known, on average, to live six to ten years, but there are records of birds surviving in captivity for 40 years or more. If this was indeed the same raven, perhaps his summer diet of gas station snacks served to help him to get through and with enough calories to survive the harsh, touristless winters. Or maybe he's an anomaly, like the rare chain-smoking factory worker who lives to be a hundred. Either way, I hope to see George next time we go up to Yellowstone. So there we have it, guys. That was all 21 pictures that are on the sale. Um, once again, let's see here, we're looking at, it is, okay, good. I've got six more minutes. If anyone has any more questions about these works, uh, anything at all, I am here. Let's see, we've got, got Lane, we've got Renzo. 
Uh, and I'm going to put all of this online so you can watch it at your leisure if you want to um, see it again. Uh, if you have any uh, friends that are into birds or landscapes or ink work, uh, you know, this would make a really great gift because they're small and easy to mail. Um, as I explained at the beginning of this, um, all the works are on sale for just $120 US. That comes with the matting, the frame, not frame, but the matting that can go into a frame and it also gets uh, shipped in a really hardcore mailer so things won't be bent up by the time it gets to you. And, uh, but yeah, that's uh, my art show that I've done here today. And I just can't thank you enough for showing up. Uh, I have, uh, let's see, uh, be sure if you haven't already to sign up for my newsletter. Uh, I let you know when, you know, I might be doing more of these uh, when they're coming up. Uh, and when people are on my news list, they actually get um, another discount on top of things and they get to first dibs basically on pieces before I put them live to everybody in the world. Uh, and, uh, and sometimes I just, you know, uh, little snippets of what I'm up to, uh, things like that. So yeah, I'll go over there. Uh, and I'm also on Twitter, Facebook, uh, and also YouTube in addition to Instagram. And I'm going to try to post this everywhere so people can watch it again. Uh, reminder, the sale only, the price of the sale uh, is only going through till Tuesday, the end of this month. And then after that, it'll go back up and I won't be shipping anything after the end of this month because we're at such a bottleneck with shipping right now. Uh, I want to make sure that it gets to you in time. So if you're thinking about it, sooner is better than later. Um, we've already had a piece or two already get snatched up. Uh, but thank you so, so much. I am so grateful for you guys showing up today. Uh, you guys are awesome, and I'm going to hopefully this will save, and I'll be able to put it out uh, as soon as I press in. So thank you so much, you guys. I uh, hope to do this again, and uh, just thank you. I, 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 I am just very full of gratitude for all of you, and thank you so, so very much. I'll talk at you soon, okay? All right. Bye.